This is JJ Pianchi of the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign interviewing Julie Mignos Nahar on August 14th, 2017 in the University Library. Where and when were you born? Uh, Springfield, Illinois, on November 1st, 1981. Who are or were your parents and what are or were their occupations? Um, my mother was Nancy Carey and my father was um, Robert Tim Thie um, Costello. Um, they, my mother has had a variety of um, roles in her life, um, most recently the lot where she retired as a bookkeeper. Uh, my father was um, a foreman most of his life and then ended up being um, the factory manager of um, a place in Springfield called Quick Walls. Do you have any siblings? I do. Um, I have got um, my mom's other daughter, um, Wendy Elmore, um, and then I have another sister on my dad's side um, that is still alive. Um, her name is Michelle Marr, and then I had another sister um, who passed away, um, and then another brother who also passed, or is not passed, but um, I'm just not in close contact with. Were any of them in the military? Uh, siblings or family, all of the family. Siblings. Siblings. Um, no, I'm the only one. Okay. What were you doing before you entered the service? I was in high school. <laughs> What branch of the military did you serve in? Um, the Air National Guard. And so it, you enlisted. Why did you choose that branch of the service? Um, mainly out of convenience. Um, I, I think I'd driven by the base several times and they had those awesome looking planes out in front displaying. I thought that would be really cool. Um, and I think um, that, was the, that was the primary thing. There were some army bases and stuff. I think from what I knew of, I definitely liked technology and doing other things, and so I thought the Air Force would be a better fit. Mm -hmm. What happened when you departed for training camp and during your early days of training? Oh, um, I think, you know, probably, like a lot of people, just a little bit of shock. Um, I think I had a pretty good idea of what I was going into. I had a really great recruiter that was just like, just fun to the wall as much as you can and don't really think about, you know, like the mind games are going to play with you and just play right along and just, you know, don't make any, you know, make any waves or whatever. Um, so that I think definitely the one night I definitely remember arriving, of course, and, and uh, you know, being on the concrete pad and doing like pick up and sit down with our luggage for I don't know how long. I think I was one of the mid arrivers or people that arrived before me and after me. and for I think at least four or five, maybe six hours we were out there just doing that. And, and I can definitely relate to that now as a, a, a mother who the first few days of, first few years of your child's life of being completely sleep deprived. And, and that definitely I always go back to that moment. Um, but that definitely, um, I was surrounded by a lot of my mom and my boyfriend and, um, and my, the rest of my extended family were all there. So it was a very like momentous occasion in, our, in all of our lives. And, um, probably one of the most significant things at that time was my niece, who's six years younger than I am. I think we were just sort of uh, moving through different stages of our own lives, and she wrote me a really heartfelt letter that I read on the airplane, and I still remember like word by word what she wrote. And um, so that was another big significant thing for me in that experience. So, mm -hmm. do you recall your instructors, and if so, what were they like? Yes, I do um, recall them pretty well. Um, I was, um, out of our flight of 60 women, I was our top physical activity or physical uh, fitness person. Um, and so they were pretty hard on me in terms of what I was doing. So I didn't blend on the wall very much with that thing. Um, so I think I definitely remember them um, just being typical in terms of like, you know, yelling, screaming, but they were always... Um, there was always that softer side too that you would see from time to time. And I think you're always sort of hoping for those little glimmers of that. It's sort of not so see them as a, in, in a human light, but more of just, um, they're not wearing their professional hat either to see them more, I guess, in a human light. But, um, and so I remember a couple of different, you know, really fun experiences. They, once I set it at that, that bar for myself of what I could do, they of course then helped me at that plus. And so like some really funny times were, um, like we were running uh, our final uh, graded, um, I think it was like, I don't know, the mile or the two mile, I don't know what we were running. Um, and I reported my time and at the end, we were all like listing out what our time was. And so I report my time back in and my, my trainer actually realized at that time that I had passed him at some point. And he's like, you must have gone by me so fast. I really didn't realize. And that was like a really big pat on my back um, to just feel like, yeah, I beat him in his time and he didn't realize me passing him, which was actually was a really good thing for me. So. And then um, another time I remember that was really significant for me in my relationships with one of them in particular in terms of how he encouraged me and, and broke, me, broke me down but then also built me back up was um, 
the very, very last, like, like the confident or the um, training piece that we went to, the confidence course. Um, and so same thing, like right out of the gates, I like went through the first course, like no problems. And um, we got to the, the next section and it was more water-based. And um, I had to do this underarm over leg, you know, over a pool of water. And I got to the very end of it and just missed the ledge by like a millimeter and I fell in. And so then what that meant is that I then, that, you know, the one of the TIs that was there from another group, the technical instructor was like, you know, do you know how to swim? And, you know, and I was like, yeah. And he's like, okay. He's like, well, you're now going to be the person that's going to make sure no one else dies and drowns. And I was like, okay. So I had to stand there and watch everyone else go by me. And that was so hard. And so my drill instructor, by the time he caught up with the group that he was tracking, just like berated me. And he's like, I had such good, you know, hopes that you were going to like, you know, beat the record and blah, 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 and all this kind of stuff. So, um, but then he also like, you know, saw me fall in all the other water events because I just could not, I have no upper body strength. So anyway, so it was kind of an interesting experience um, seeing it through their eyes. So. Mm -hmm. Did you receive any specialized training? And if so, in what? Um, I went, um, after basic training, I went into what they called, um, because I mean, I'm so funny, I've done so many memory dumps in this stuff, I cannot recall all the names and dates and what they, things are called. Um, like a more specialized training um, for vehicle operations. So when I was 18 and decided what I wanted to do, um, I tested in for different things and um, a lot of them were working in an office, doing technical things, and I just decided I didn't want to spend the next six years of my life every weekend a month or one week in a month going and sitting in an office. And so I decided to go be a vehicle operator because I love to be outside, I love to get my hands free, I love to work with people that are all different backgrounds. Um, and so that's what I did. So I did that, it was just a really short training for like seven weeks, I think, um, just on how to operate machinery and um, how to load, how to do a little bit of logistics in terms of like, you know, manipulating numbers and making sure load, and, you know, uh, amounts are right when you're loading planes and things like that. So um, moving personnel, understanding logistics behind all of that, those dynamics and stuff. So. Mm -hmm. How did you adapt to military life, including the physical regimen, barracks, food, and social life? Ooh, um, I think definitely finding out what your strengths and weaknesses are the very first thing you have to do. Um, and that may happen through <laughs> trial and error. It may happen because you already are aware of them, of some self level of self-awareness before you go in. At 18, I think we were all kind of, you know, struggling with that. Um, I think definitely for me, like I right away, I made friends with people. I, I had two friends that weren't really friend friends, but I had kind of known of them um, that we went together. And so we were kind of friends, but not like super close when we were there. And then um, so quickly, I, I, some of my other, the girls that were in, in my flight really recognized that um, my physical strength. And so they would come to me and I would help them like late at night after lights were out, like to help them get better at like, their form for doing push-ups and sit-ups and things like that. Um, and then in return, they would help me fold my t-shirts because I was like horrible at doing that, for instance. So I think sort of understanding how those dynamics that you can work together in a team um, really help everyone get better. Um, and I think um, chow hall for sure. Um, I wasn't a vegetarian at the time, but I've been a vegetarian now for like almost 10 years. And so I think definitely even that time, meat wasn't like a big thing for me. So like I always remember looking forward to the vegetarian lasagna on Thursday, <laughs> I think it was lunch. So I remember like standing in line waiting to like walk into the chow hall and like seeing the menu post and I'd always get like so giddy excited about that. <laughs> um, so yeah, so I don't know if that helps. Yeah, I'll answer your question. Mm -hmm. Where were you stationed? Um, my base was out of Springfield, Illinois at the 183rd Fighter Wing, which now I believe is a machine shop. Um, they got the government reorganization probably about eight years ago or so. Um, they got a new mission. Um, and that was my primary station. And then I was also deployed and um, stationed at United Arab Emirates um, at Anabu Dhabi, where in, um, in the, you know, um, Al Dafra, I think was the name of that base. Yeah. So what were some of your memories of being abroad? Um, it's really interesting. Um, definitely, um, I grew a lot. Um, my memories a lot are of growing as a human being. Um, one more, more significantly was probably more my long-term professional life. Um, when I was deployed, I was deployed with, there were six people that were from my unit. My supervisor at my home base was also my supervisor um, where I was, where I was uh, stationed at. 
but then we were blended in with a bunch of other people that were from all over, you know. Um, and because my supervisor knew me, but also I was one of the only ones who were, who were at my ranking where I had a four-year degree. So that was in my record somewhere. I don't know how. <laughs> and um, I had just graduated college in the, like, the year before. I would worked for like nine months out of college before I was deployed. And, um, and so he thought I would make great supervisor material. And so he like deemed me the first day to be the supervisor over, I don't know, like 50 guys. And um, so that was really tough as a female. It was tough as learning how to, what does it mean to be a boss? What does it mean to be a female boss? Um, over, especially particularly in a male dominated field. Um, so a lot of it, a lot of, a lot of learning in terms of that. Um, the, the place we were at was relatively safe. We had a few like bomb threats and things like that, but it was considered a war zone at the time. I think it's now been reclassified as, as non-threatening area, but mainly because of the mission that we were serving at the time. And also because I think a lot of the, the money that gets filtered and comes through you know, the Arab Emirates. So it's a high profile place, but not in terms of violence or terrorism towards, and I think we had a good relationship with the Emiratis, so that also really helped. But, um, so yeah, so I don't know if that answers your question. Sorry, mm-hmm. yeah. yeah. <clears throat> no, just broad general question about yeah, memories. Yeah, I know, right, yeah. <laughs> um, so you were not on the front lines? No. No. So what were your duties while you were there? Um, most of my duties were, um, as a supervisor, looking at um, transportation um, logs, basically, in terms of what were what was coming in and out of our base. Um, so the main mission of that particular um, air base was refueling the fighter jets that were over the Middle East and over the Horn of Africa. Mm-hmm. So. Most of what we did was moving personnel, moving cargo. Um, oftentimes, it, we were sort of like a safe hub where, um, excuse me, where cargo would come in, and um, oftentimes it was not oftentimes, but we had some really awesome missions where it was very secretive about what was going on and where it was being moved. So being really diligent about timing and understanding, you know, this the the importance of what was going on and when it was happening. So. Um, that was the majority of our work that we did. Um, there was other, like, of course, things, just general maintenance of, like, the vehicles on the, on the, mm-hmm. on the base um, for whatever reason, whether that was a forklift or a bus or um, whatever it could be. Um, other things we did that were more, like, diplomacy-related was moving, um, like, generals or things like that that would come into the airport that was nearby at, at Abu Dhabi. Um, and so having, once again, like some sensitivity and training around who was coming, who was going, like, and knowing who was who, and um, that was another kind of piece of the job that um, I learned a lot about who I was networking with and who was, who was around me and um, understanding the, you know, the military system beyond just sort of the Air Force, but also beyond what I was doing in my, you know, my work there, so. What kinds of friendships and camaraderie did you form while serving and with whom? Um, the interesting thing is most of my camaraderie while I was there ended up not being with the people I was originally from the same base. I kind of had that idea that we'd go there. I had one in particular who's a really close friend of mine still. Um, I, you know, we don't talk very often, but we just have, we've had a more intimate, intimate relationship in terms of um, sharing more life experiences and, and how we've shared. Um, anyways, he's been a great buddy of mine to run a lot of dating issues and that sort of stuff by. Um, but a lot of it, I think, in terms of like, you've had that shared experience. so. Um, the good, the bad, and the ugly, and, and I think I always say if you live together, and you work together, and you eat together, and you sleep together, like, you've, you've got to figure out a way to manage those relationships. So either you can just completely go off and be a fly on the wall, and no one knows you, and no one talks to you, but when shit hits the fan, like, you got to have people to go to and, and to relate to. So um, a lot of the people I made, for some reason, were in, like, the communications um, groups, and so I had some really great opportunities with um, getting to see other parts of Abu Dhabi, or, or other parts of Dubai through that experience. Um, so that was really neat to get to go and, like, be on other, you know, other big cities and experiencing the culture in a whole other way. Um, so those, for me, were more, um, even now, like, just networking, just kind of seeing, I think, a different walk of life, because even though we didn't have maybe the same... Um, background, we saw the same values, and that was a really big piece to me of like the now seeing them. Like, I'm not on Facebook anymore, but for many, many years I was, and so just kind of seeing where their path is going, a lot more of them were active duty. So, like, how my life is different than their life in terms of um, civilian life and sort of still being in that military path. 
Um, but I think it, we still rely on each other. It is, it's just like one guy, for instance, was getting redeployed at the same base. And you know, he sent me an email. I was like, hey, I haven't talked to him forever. I just want to let you know I'm going back there. So obviously there was something special about um, our, our conversations there or just even things like meeting up at the gym to support each other through whatever stage of we were going through, whether that was what was going on back home or what we were dealing with at you know, work, um, you know, bomb threats, whatever, how the stresses of that sort of life that people you know, take on. So. Mm-hmm. How did you stay in touch with family and friends back home? Well, the nice thing about being a supervisor is you can generally get a little more privileges. That, that was definitely the one big perk of the job. So there was, um, I, I don't even know who did this, but I'm sure many cycles of people before us, and I somehow, I don't even know how I found it. Um, it was a shipping container that was out in the middle of like our parking area that we had out in the middle of a desert pretty much with like a small little overhang. Um, that there was, it was like a supply, it wasn't like a supply closet, but it had a lot of like cleaning materials that you would use to like, the, we would work on the cars and the, the trucks and whatever to like, whatever, you know, sweep something out, like, you know, whatever. And so there was a phone line in there and it literally was like just a free connection to the United States. And so I would go like on my breaks or whatever and I'd go sneak away and go call my boyfriend and uh, who's my husband now. Um, and so that was the main thing. So I think I was, I was really fortunate in that I got to talk to him a lot. So I'd say at least like maybe four times a week, I would give him a call. So, um, that was good and bad though. Um, there was definitely where, um, like when I was going through my own transition of learning how to be a boss, learning how to be a female boss and dealing with the dynamics of whatever and having my own political views that I had and I still have those political views but um, I would come off very strong to a lot of people and especially to feet to males who being soft, that maybe thought I would be softer or more understanding or whatever but I still wanted them to do their job and so I would hold them to that and so oftentimes um, what I was coping with internally I would then like uh, emotionally vomit that all over my boyfriend who on the other line can't do anything about it and is really feeling helpless um, and so I think it was really hard for him in many ways that was more challenging, even though it was like, and I think too, like, you know, he knew I was obviously in a really pretty safe place, but there's always that what if that just still is, um, you know, over your head. Um, so that was the main, the main way I kept in touch. Um, email, of course, that was still, it was already common, pretty well known. So, uh, more friends and family. I had a couple of friends, um, one in particular, that was just amazing. She would send me care packages all the time. Um, she was she had these like amazing chocolate chips that she would send and so I would share them with everybody so everyone was always waiting for her package to come um, so those little touches touchdowns of like life back home I back you know and she would send me these really cool like cards she was really into like stationery um, and so I had like my whole like um, bunk area that was just like I would just post them up everywhere and it just they gave me that little like bright sunshiny part of like you know living in the desert and like putting on your boots and um, you know, and, and for me, feeling a little bit like more girly for me, that felt more like attached to that other side of me that, like, you know, you lose in terms of like putting your uniform on, like the same, like, the individuality of who you are. I guess maybe it's a better way of putting it. So um, that was the primary way. And my um, my mom, same thing, would write write emails, but we didn't get a, a ton of letters. A few in there, you get like cards for like holidays or things like that. But yeah, most most of the time, electronic communication. So mm-hmm. what did you do for recreation or when you were off duty? Um, yeah, so I've always been a big runner, um, and so that was a big, big piece of it, and I really got a lot of solace from that, because I, I worked, um, 3 a.m. to 3 p.m., and so, um, generally, you know, be getting a little bit cooler around, like, 5, 6 p.m., and so I would generally go out and go for a run, which wasn't common for me, because I've always been, like, a morning exerciser, um, and so that was a big thing I would do, just to kind of get out, and it was a really big deal, because where I would run was kind of unsafe, but it was a marked area, but it was off base. Um, so they, you had to check out, like it was a whole security process for you to like you know, give out like a thousand IDs, like they take a picture of you, all that kind of stuff. Um, and I go out and like long, run like this long path. And so I, the thing I love about that was because I actually got to see a lot of wildlife out there, whether it was wildlife I wanted to see, like gigantic spiders crossing the desert or like, fo- like desert foxes, things like that. And those are like little pieces that I would look forward to. Um, and the other part would I would always go to the gym. So I had some buddies that I would go and I've always, like in high school, I was a competitive weightlifter. So I love to just kind of go and like show that like just camaraderie around that, you know, and, and getting tips from people and, and sharing fun things. I think too, it also gave me an opportunity to bond with the guys I was overseeing in a light that wasn't in a supervisory role. So that was, uh, that was important for me too, to find time with them. So, and eat, you know, you look forward to food all the time. It was like the only thing you think about. So I love where we were being in that, this small token of loving it. Um, on Fridays, um, the, the, 
the folks who were third country national that were from that area, um, hopefully I always, I would ask them different questions and I would I was always curious. I, I had some great relationships with meeting um, different people, like one person who worked like, you know, um, in our, I think it was like in our dry cleaning place. I mean, this sounds like so, like, <laughs> not a war experience for sure. Um, and then um, I think like in the post office or something like that. And um, and just getting getting opportunities to sort of meet them and talk to them. And, and so also same in the chow hall, like I talked with several of the, the people that I would see all the time and ask them questions. So they would cook like food from, from where they were from. And, um, and I would just love that because I've always loved ethnic food and whatever. And so I would just get in conversation with them about the food and like how they make it and how it ties in their culture and what they miss about that. So that for me was like another layer of just the learning experience I had from living somewhere else. And then I tried to make the best of it and not just sort of stay like in just like with my group of people that I'm just gonna, you know. So anyways, yeah. When you were in the service, did you read for pleasure? And if so, what? Um, Probably not a ton. Um, I'm trying to think of what I did read. Um, hmm. I know I read at least a couple of books while I was there. Um, Cause I'm actually not a big reader, which is ironic. I spent most of my life in a library. Um, but and I'm sure my mom is still to this day doesn't understand how that happened. But um, so. Um, Anyways, I can't remember. There was, I remember there was two particular books I went and checked out that we had like a, on, our, on our base. There was like a small little, like in someone's office that had like DVDs and, and books that were like, people would rotate and leave. And um, so yeah, probably a couple books I honestly can't remember. They were obviously memorable, so. <laughs> Do you remember the genre? No, I don't. I'm, I'm not, I'm more of a nonfiction person. So I'm sure it was like a self-help book of some degree, probably trying to help me through whatever I was going through at the time. So um, yeah. Okay. What particular book would you say influenced your life the most and why? Uh, let's see. Um, this is so hard to say. Um, if it can be something more recent, I don't know if that's important to you or not. Um, Whatever you want. Okay. One, I'm, in a, I'm currently in a very interesting stage of my life in terms of... Um, just an evolution of who I am as a person, what certain things mean to me, and I'm always trying to, you know, just better myself and be a better person. And um, so, one book that has really, really, in like the last six months, has really just had a profound impact on me is *A Man's Search for Meaning*. Um, and so, I think um, the main thing for me there, especially the how how our world right now currently is, like the stuff going on in Virginia, um, just in general, like how people. Um, you know, and whatever, the politics of the world right now and, and how, when it comes down to it, you know, we're all, we're all literally the same blood. Like we are, you know, we all descend from Africa, whatever you, however you want to see it and perceive it and how some people can just have so much hate in their heart and, um, and to like, you know, I sit here even as a veteran and I'm a very privileged veteran, like I earn my status through, um, you know, but it was also very strategic in how I got there in terms of, um, the guys I was with um, were deployed to Iraq while I was in school. My supervisor at the time, I volunteered, my supervisor at the time, which was a different person than what I was deployed with, it was his boss, did not want me to go. His, he wanted me to finish school. He said, do not go. I won't, I won't have any breaks when you finish school. And then, you know, we'll see how things go. And then so we got tapped pretty quickly after they got back. It's supposed to be like 18 months, but at the time, vehicle operations was a huge demand in the Air Force. And so um, when I got... Um, the opportunity to go to the United Arab Emirates, I jumped on that knowing that that was hopefully going to be a safer place for me to go than wherever else I could have been sent to Afghanistan or Iraq. So it was very strategic in, in terms of how I wanted to serve my country, but also hopefully literally reduce my risk of dying. Mm -hmm. um, so I think for, for me, um, you know, all those little experiences that you have make you the human being you are today, but trying to really understand that, um, you know, everyone has a story. Everyone has uh, different things they've they've gone through, and some of them, some of us have gone through much worse experiences. And I think too, regardless of like, okay, how do you then in the end, through all of whatever good or bad experience you've had, how do you treat another human being? And then also, how do you treat yourself? And and how do you um, you know make the best of your situation? Um, this particular book, I think, has really made me um, you know see someone who's gone through an incredible experience 
and I can, you know, there's glimmers of that of like what basic training felt like, you know, of like, you, you know, in, in the end, you know, it's still a mind game. And for them, that's how they knew they, in some ways they knew it was a mind game, but also knowing like your life could be taken from you at any moment. And I think truly there's some component of that. And you have that fear in, in the military, of course, on any level. Um, but the, um, for me, that book in particular has been, um, how do you take those experiences and then make meaning out of them in terms of, um, you know, it's all about how you perceive it and trying to be positive and trying to find hope. And then for me taking that book and then applying it to my life now and really trying to um, be a voice for other people and, and not, not in a, I'm going to represent you, but in a way that, um, you know, speaking to my people and saying what you're doing is not okay, you know, and trying to be that voice internally that then hopefully will shift the paradigm um, in some way, whether it's a small seed that gets planted for someone to understand that, like the systems of how things have happened instead of it just seeing it as a color issue or um, a race issue or whatever. So I don't know, mm -hmm. it's a long answer to a question, but <laughs> yeah. Okay. I'm a much bigger, bigger reader now than I was in the military, which is good. So <laughs> I'm like, I can't pull a lot about from that time frame. But anyway, so. <laughs> it's all right. Did you use libraries when you were in the service? Why or why not? Yes, I did. So um, both from the community level, um, I like for, just for instance, um, even when before I went to the service, I went to the library to get um, the ASVAP, you know, uh, aptitude test guide, you know. Um, I always, you know, it was kind of like where to go. I went there to get my ACT one, like that's where I went to get my ASVAP one. Um, definitely then, of course, was like um, as a student, I was in undergrad um, through, you know, I went to community college and I transferred to undergrad. So. Um, this of course back in the days when like libraries were still, you saw people that were more physically doing things like in the, you know, in the reference sections and pulling out journal articles. Um, so there was, for me, there's always been a comfort. I grew up, uh, my mom is a huge reader, has like a room full of books. Um, we didn't have much growing up, but there was always books in the house. Um, but the, so moving through that experience, it's always been a very safe place for me. I've always seen librarians, they've always played a significant role in my life. So. Um, sitting in college, having a few that I kind of got attached to in community college and then again in, in undergrad um, that are just a wealth of knowledge and generally very friendly people and generally um, just very humble about their knowledge and um, how they share it and sort of expose you to different things. And then um, like when I was, I don't think, I can't remember if there was ever like a library like on my base in Springfield that I ever went to, but like I said, when I was deployed, definitely there was like this small little library that I think, I don't wanna say it was like in the chaplain's office or something like that, um, that I, I definitely ventured into once in a while once I found out about it. Um, and then, um, yeah, and then finishing undergrad and I'm trying to think, yeah, cause I, and then just briefly for like, Literally like a month, I had started grad school before I was, my contract was up. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So, yeah, definitely use libraries then, too. <laughs> How did you return home? Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, I was kind of an oddball, so because I had applied to grad school before I left to be deployed. And I got in while I was deployed, and so it was a bit of a craziness of trying to get me back because... Um, I wanted to start school um, as soon as I could, but my group that was coming back, um, our, our end date just kept getting moved and moved and moved and moved. Like not significantly, some people it's like six months extensions. Ours it was like three to four to like one day to like 10 days. And so like as I'm watching like the clock just like ding, ding, ding. And I'm like, I just, you know, I, I really need to get back to go to school. And not knowing at the time, it probably wasn't a very good move for me. I really should have taken a semester to just like transition back to civilian, even though it wasn't that difficult, it was still like just remember standing in front of my closet and just like not knowing what on earth to put on and those sort of things. And so I literally went from like getting on the plane to like driving home to Champaign to go to school the next day. That's exactly what I did. So it was crazy. So in the end, what happened was my group, our day kept getting postponed and I really made a stink about it. And I went up to like my, in our, in my, um, I don't know what it was, like my department, um, the commander there. And basically said like here's the deal like I'm starting grad school I really want to get back on time is there any way we can make some you know route we freaking fly planes this is our, I know the planes are going back to the state is there any way I can jump on something and so lo and behold it was like three days of trying and so they got me on a couple different flights and some got canceled which is always a bummer when you get your bags packed and you're ready to go and you have to go back so I can't remember the whole route but I literally flew from like you know three different countries I ended up somehow in Germany on like um, and then I remember what happened this is kind of a funny story at the time it was not funny. Um, so I ended up in Germany and I'm at like the civilian part of their airport on base. 
and most people that fly through there are like retirees who are trying to get, I don't know what they call that program, but, um, and so what happens is the lady who's working there at, at sort of being the, uh, working for the, the Air Force airline, um, tells me that I can't get on there because I don't have permission for my commander back home to go home. So I made it like halfway home and she's telling me I can't go anywhere. And so I was like, oh my gosh, like what am I gonna do? And I had already stayed overnight. And so it was, this was at like 3 a.m. in the morning. Or actually I think it was like, I don't remember, it was, it could have been 3 in the morning because it was like 3 a.m. in the morning back in the States. So it might've been like whatever, 8 a.m. or something like that, 9 a.m. And so she's like, well, the only way you, I can put you on this flight is if you can get in contact with your commander. And I was like, how am I going to find out who my commander, like, I don't even, like, I barely talked to the guy, maybe like three times my whole life. So like, I'm going to call him up, wake him up in the middle of the night because I want to come home because I'm being selfish because I want to start grad school. And so I was like, oh my gosh, how am I going to, like, well, I have nothing else to do. So I have nothing else to do. I have to get out of Germany. I can't stay here forever and ever. So, so I literally uh, called, like, the, the, the um, security forces on my base, got some random number to my base. I don't know how, you know, I didn't have, like, internet at the time, you know, on your phone or whatever. So I'm sure I asked somebody, whatever. And then called, um, he then got in touch with the commander and put me, patched me through. And so he was just, like, the most awesome. He knew, of course, the whole story because people who are really good with people know what's going on. So he knew I was trying to get home and he knew why and all that kind of stuff. So he was like, Julie, absolutely. Like, we'll find you a way to get home. And we're just like weeping because I was just so thankful to have someone who was on my team, you know, like, yes, he doesn't mind that like I'm selfishly wanting to come home. So anyways, so lo and behold, like, you know, the, she, the lady talked to my commander on the phone and he was like, get on that flight. And I mean, where he like kind of went through a little bit. So, anyway, so yeah, so got on that flight and then this really awesome guy on that flight, I remember who I still have pictures from, he used to um, run, um, Oh gosh, I can't remember what they're called. This is so horrible. I like memory dumped all of this stuff. Um, it's one of the spy planes. And so he worked with the astronauts that, to suit them up to work on one of the spy planes that go up at like 70,000 feet. And so he, he gave me um, like 30 amazing pictures from like, it was so cool to see it because that stuff I didn't have access to, but like all of us played a part in that experience for that astronaut and the experience of what the, the our mission was to do, but like you don't get that feedback, and and so it was really cool for me to like kind of have that like sort of tie my experience like a nice little bow, and so I still share those pictures every once in a while with different people, and um, yeah, they're pretty special. So anyway, so yeah, I finally made it home, flew home, you know, um, stayed overnight like on the East Coast, and finally flew back to St. Louis, um, and my family was there, and and it was a pretty magical time, and and then um, yeah, and then I drove from St. Louis to to Champaign, stayed overnight, and started grad school the next day, yeah. Still pulling sand out of your boots. Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> just barely, like, just, you know, trying to figure out what was going on, you know. So, yeah, I still remember to this day just standing in front of my closet and just being like, what on earth do I put on? Like, and this is a whole, like, meaning of life and, like, you know, all those sort of things of, like, you know, like, anyway, so, like, do these, do I even like these clothes anymore? Like, is this who I am as a person? You know, all those sort of things. That, like, you know, no matter what transition you go through, it's still a transition. And so it's, yeah, so having choice is a definite transition. So, yeah. How were you received by your family and community when you came back? Well, um, so that was a bit interesting for me because my my uh, group that, that flew back, like they came back after me. I, it was really only like three days. So then I kind of beat myself up about it because I was like, I should just wait it because I really wanted to come back with them because that's who I shared that experience with. Um, and so they had like the big, like, you know, airport greeting in, in Springfield, Illinois, you know, um, so that was, I was, I felt kind of like, um, just sad about that. You know, I know for, for other vets and stuff that, you know, they didn't have any piece of any of that. You know, even their families might've been a little bit, you know, upset with them, whatever, depending on their beliefs, but, um, for their service and in the Vietnam era and things like that. But, um, so that was pretty much it. Um, I think there was like, um, through the communications team at, at, uh, in Springfield, they did like a little write-up, I think, in like the local paper or something like that. And that was really it. I think um, a lot of people knew I was deployed, so people were just, you know, happy to see me back and just, how are you doing, that kind of thing. So, um, but yeah, nothing major. Yeah. Yeah. How did you readjust to civilian life? <laughs> um, yeah, definitely the outfits was a big thing. I would say... Um, routine was really important um, especially because I went from such a drastic change again um, and surrounding myself with family so I remember seeing my family a lot I remember like you know sometimes the adjustment wasn't so great I'll give you a perfect example it's not horrible but um, was I had I think I'd been back for like 10 days and I still hadn't gone through like my pile of mail and 
So I was going home to Springfield with my mom. I was living here in Champaign, driving home to Springfield. And I, uh, when I was over deployed overseas, you know, there's like the speed limit is like, I don't know, you know, 100 miles an hour pretty much. And so I got used to driving that fast. You know, I'd go different places and especially when I'd be transporting clients or clients, uh, people, whatever, moving cargo, different places that were outside of our base. And um, you had to keep up with traffic. Like, if not, you're just going to die, you know. And um, literally, people used to, like, SUVs just, like, roll over in the sand because they were just driving like maniacs. But um, anyways, and so what happened? I don't know, RPG. Or, you know, I'm, I'm like, it just sounds like such a privileged experience. But it really was. But anyways, um, and so then um, I was probably going, like, 50 miles an hour in, like, a 25. It, this is, you know, I just, it was just such an automatic thing. I think I hadn't really been in a car even much since I came back. Um, I'd probably taken the bus to and from campus and stuff. And so I got pulled over and, um, and got a ticket. And so the, the only reason why I think he gave me a ticket was because he asked me for my insurance. And I, I didn't even have, I was just so kind of like still floating in this like weird realm between places. It didn't even dawn on me to tell him, like, I've just been deployed. I don't, haven't gotten my shit together yet. I've got a stack of mail. I'm sure my new insurance card is in there somewhere. And I, it didn't even dawn on me to like say something like that, which I'm sure he would have been like, okay, that's no big deal, you know. I probably even sell like my uniform bag or whatever and like the trunk still, you know. So that was kind of like a bit like thing I look back and like I, I was definitely in a place of like just still fuzzy of where I was and what I was doing. So um, anyways, and so that was just kind of a interesting example of how that goes because I definitely would never drive like that in normal circumstances. So anyway, so they, I, I, you know, I paid the ticket, but I think, I think that's what he wrote me the ticket for was the insurance and not for the speeding. I think that's what happened. But and it was like getting my, uh, or maybe I got two tickets, I don't remember, but so the, the insurance thing, I of course showed justification for that I had it and da da da. So good, that got removed. But thinking back, I could have just said something and, you know, I mean, like that's a logical explanation for understanding how the brain works at this stage and you know, how we understand that a little bit better now. So oh, sure. Yeah. Hmm. Have you remained in contact with or reunited with fellow veterans? And if so, who? Um, definitely contact. I mean, Facebook, I think, is phenomenal for that. Um, it's been interesting, too. Since the years have passed, there were some particular comrades I did not get along with at all that have since become my friends on Facebook. So I don't know if that time has kind of healed things or just sort of curiosity of what like, I'm doing with my life now. I don't know what, uh, you know, whatever that could be. Um, but definitely there are some that I was, to, that I was in my base with in Springfield. Um, but I, it's, it's so weird about it is because I'm much closer with the people I was deployed with that were from other bases than I am even with the ones that I was with in my station in, my, in Springfield. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of strange. But there's some same thing I didn't have a great relationship with, but now, um, to me, like we comment on each other's stuff, and, and it's just a different, a strange level of camaraderie. I don't know if that's ever been studied in terms of how social media plays into like the present time versus like the, you know, mm -hmm. once time has passed. So, um, but yeah, I don't see them on a frequent basis. And I don't know if that once again is like the female male kind of thing. Um, you know, my, my significant other now has always been um, really supportive of um, the relationships I've, I've had around that. But I think some of their female maybe partners maybe aren't, I don't know. Mm -hmm. So um, there's definitely an element to that. Like, um, you know, like there's one for instance that he, um, his wife was posting a lot of stuff about like their family and so I friended her because I wanted to see how he was doing mm -hmm. and so she was fine with that you know and, and accepted me and, and that sort of thing so um, there's little things like that but like I said not really much on uh, social media anymore but um, and there's kind of a piece of that I wonder too I haven't really thought about that if that's maybe another piece of it kind of just tied that in a little bow even more and kind of distance myself from some of those relationships because those people are always in your head somehow somewhere and so it's like maybe that's just kind of giving time to sort of move further away from that but yeah, so are you a member of any veterans organizations and if so which um no sadly i've just i've heard reputations that a lot of them are really not female friendly mm -hmm. um and so i haven't really sought out that um those experiences um i've had one per particular uh, time that i had a really great experience though that it you know, it could have been just a weird thing. But when I came back and I was at the veteran's office after I came back um, to get like registered and get to, to go to VA services or whatever, I have a horrible back and all those kind of other issues. But, um, and there were these two um, Vietnam War vets who caught me in the hallway and they were like, um, oh, like you're a veteran? I'm like, yeah. And, and they were like, oh, like, thank you. They were just like profusely like, thank you so much for your service. Thank you so much. And I was just like, 
I didn't really do that much. I'm like, it's not a big deal. And they were like, no, no, there's a big difference between you and me no matter what you did is that you volunteered. We didn't volunteer. And I was like, oh, that kind of like blew my mind. I was like, I've never in a million years thought about it in that way. Um, whether that was before there was war times, I signed up, of course, in 2000 before 9-11 happened. Um, and so I think in their mind, I, I was just a different vet, you know, mm-hmm. a more respectable vet somehow. And I'm like, that just I feel like goes back generationally of how society coped with things at that time. You know, whether you were volunteered or not, um, it was still a, you know, a huge contribution to our country. So mm-hmm. anyways, I don't think that answers your question. <laughs> <laughs> what have you done since separating from the military? Um, so I went to grad school. Um, I started a couple of different businesses since then. I did a pet sitting business. Um, I've had other like small entrepreneur, like starting like Etsy kind of stuff. Um, and so I went to grad school in social work. Um, interesting story about the military. So I went in the military to become a police officer. I really wanted to go and serve my community in that way. Um, and I wanted to learn how to shoot a gun. I'd never shot a gun before and just sort of learn all those aspects that I thought would make me more, um, you know, uh, competitive when I would go. I really wanted to be an Illinois State Police Officer and eventually work up to be a detective. That was kind of like my long-term goal. Mm-hmm. I had an uncle that passed away um, that was like in the Navy and a long-time service member in Hingakee and, and um, um, as a police officer and I just really admired him. And that was sort of like my, my goal, my, loosely my goals in life. Um, went to the basic training and uh, learned, how to, learned about guns, went to go shoot a gun. And as we were walking from the building where we were taking the guns apart to where our shooting ring was, I was just weeping, weeping, weeping. Um, I had no idea the control that I had that I was going to have over other people's lives and that really scared me shitless and I was like well I guess I'm kind of done with this military thing six years I have to figure this out but at least in that moment I decided to, to be a social worker I wanted to help people in other ways using nonviolent, you know interventions mm-hmm. um, so that was the military really served me in that way and really kind of guided my career in a different direction so then went to grad school and I got an awesome opportunity to do an internship um, at an organization in Springfield called the autism program and so I really had no experience working with people with disabilities or their families and the complications around that. And it was a really momentous time in the autism world at the time because um, healthcare was changing a lot. We were, research was just coming out at like a really rapid, fast pace. Um, so I went on and that was my big thing. I, um, I got to serve on a grant that I helped write as an intern that um, really looked at healthcare and how it, um, physicians and uh, families were interacting around the autism world. Mm-hmm. Um, then I loved that and went and uh, worked in community nutrition and um, worked as a supervisor again. And so I had a lot of growing pains again, but so much of that, um, I was a much better supervisor because of what I had learned in the military. Um, and then I supervised like a, uh, a group of 10 people in different counties and stuff and um, did that for a while. Then I was a stay-at-home mom for a while um, and really savored my time with my kiddos, but I know it's not something I wanted to do forever. Um, and so now I'm back working as a faculty member at the School of Social Work and helping um, young students, um, bachelor's level, decide where they want to intern at and, and helping them navigate the community organizations and then sort of networking and sort of being that liaison between those people. So I'm kind of using the best of all my um, skills and, and that's why I'm, I'm really excited. I'm only like four months into this job. So yeah, so I have like a full cycle of the semester will be my first round this year. So yeah, so pretty excited. Cool. As a veteran, have you ever used, have you used your local library? Why or why not? Absolutely, for many, many reasons. Um, for me, um, it's a free resource that's, I think, completely untapped by a lot of people. Um, and I think more importantly, as a social worker and also as a veteran, I think that, um, you know, libraries are, are more community centers now at this point in our time. You know, um, books are available in a lot of different forms now, so it's not just that. It's like, what is a library? How does it reserve the community? Not just through learning, but... Um, through networking, through collaboration, through, um, you know, just bettering your, you know, what you do and how you serve the people that live there. Um, so I've definitely used um, all levels of, you know, in academia libraries, for sure, like online, I use that a ton. Um, for a while, I was, um, I, I think a big focus of my work in grad school was working at looking at veteran, female veteran issues, um, in particular looking at females who are re um, because I think a lot of people, in, I'm kind of babbling, but a lot of people in our society do not really understand how guard and reserve function. And so they have this idea of the military that it's, you know, a four year, you know, or, or an active duty base and you, people will sign up for four years or whatever. Um, but people do not realize that like at this day and age, it's, you know, it's, it's about 50-50 split of active, um, active duty and guard and reserve are getting deployed. And so we have zero infrastructure for those people who are guard and reserve for those families and particular veteran, female veteran families who are then getting deployed and their other partner back home, they have no resources. You know, they might even live two hours from where their base is. 
And so um, I've used the libraries a lot in that way of, of looking at journal articles. And I remember I wrote a really awesome paper in grad school that at the time was really relevant. Now it's not because people have so much more awareness of it, um, of, of these issues. I remember my, my uh, uh, professor at the time was like, you need to publish this. And I was like, I don't know how to publish anything. Like I'd never even tapped into that life um, or that world. And, um, and so for sure, like the libraries really served for me to sort of get a baseline of like what information is out there on these topics and, um, and how, you know, how could I then disseminate it back out? And I really should have done that step. But um, more, more recently, um, I, you know, I don't wear my veteran status most places. Um, and so my children, we live and die by the library. We are there all the time. Like, you know, we use all the resources. My, my family and I, we are bilingual. So, um, you know, like for me, having Spanish resources is a really important component. I think it's the same thing that people don't understand, once again, the shift of how that's changed. Um, people have a very narrow-minded idea about what being American means, not realizing that, once again, um, a lot of people that are in our military are of different religions, different races, different languages, you know, sexuality, all those things. And they just have these um, very black and white ideas of what that means. And so, um, to me, using our libraries, it kind of allows people to sort of extend themselves into understanding, um, hopefully, other languages, other religions, and expand their world. So, anyways, I don't know if that answered your question, but... Mm -hmm. As a veteran, are there programs or types of books available at the library that you enjoy more than others? Um, as a veteran, this is such, I feel like this is kind of a, a narrow question in some ways, because for, right, for me right now, um, it's important to my kids to, it's important to me for my kids to have an understanding of their world. Um, world politics, world understanding of how diplomacy works, um, and once again, being open to different types of people um, really comes stems from the, the information they're receiving through me and my husband. So um, a big chunk of that is, um, for us particular, is, is um, speaking Spanish. So, um, you know, currently we, we diplomatically don't have a lot of ongoings in, you know, in Latin American countries. There are some, but obviously Venezuela is something we have to keep on, you know, keep an eye on, see how that's going. But currently, um, not really, but it also sort of opens their world to understanding, I think, through me as well. Um, it's like looking at, like, world maps, like the libraries have amazing maps, you know, of um, how things, what things look like. So. Um, and how things have changed over the years and how territories like where I was at in the Middle East, you know, how Saudi Arabia plays a key role in what's going on in the Horn of Africa, you know, all those sort of things. Um, so definitely giving them exposure to those um, pieces and resources of information that they don't, that we don't have in our home. Um, those are the main ones, I think definitely um, transitioning out of like, you know, like career choices, I think is a really big one I went through um, probably probably around the time I was coming back, like reading like what color is your parachute and um, you know, what kind of boss do you want to be? And, like all those sort of things that um, sort of like culminating our, all at the same time in my life definitely played a big part. Um, another big thing I remember that was really helpful was um, kind of therapeutic this summer. So I'd been back for like a year. I think still like, you know, not really took time to kind of sit down and be like, what happened? You know, you know it wasn't super big, like for some people who saw, you know, combat. Um, but still, once again, like, okay, what does all that mean to me in my life? And so I um, actually uh, started cooking. I learned how to cook, like, really well. And um, so I went to the library all the time. I was borrowing just all different types of cookbooks. And that was also one thing where, like, the vegetarian thing was, like, knocking on my door. Um, so how does that all play into empathy and how we see the world and stuff like that? So, yeah. So definitely libraries. Libraries, libraries, libraries. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> They're awesome. As a veteran, is there something that you wish you could change about the library that would enhance your enjoyment of it? Social workers. They need to have social workers at the libraries. Okay. How did your military or wartime experiences affect your life? Um, I think I've touched on most of the main ones. Um, I think one of the other big things that was really a difficult time in my life of trying to figure out what to do in my career was the commander who I called and woke up in the middle of the night. So him and I got, got to know each other a lot better after that. And um, I think I still had like six, so they had to extend my contract for in order for me to be deployed. I think I had like a year left on my contract when I, when I volunteered to go and then they had to extend it like another six months. And so during that last sort of extra six months um, that I served, my commander kept asking me and asking me and asking me to stay. And he really wanted me to go to officer school. And I always wonder how my life would have been different in that way. But it was a decision that, that my husband and I, that we made at that time, that it was time for me to get out. Um, we wanted to, like, a, after, um, like, 18 months later, we got married. And then I, then we had an opportunity to live in Denmark um, and for a year. 
and I would not have been able to do that either, you know, if I would have stayed in the military. So I think in a lot of ways, it's, you know, it's interesting to think how it would have changed um, in good or bad ways, so, mm -hmm. yeah. What are some of the life lessons you learned from military service? Hmm. I think the big one, um, I grew up in a small town that was 0%, well, not zero, like maybe 99.9% .9 like white <laughs> Caucasian. Um, I grew up in a family that, or my mother was very open-minded, exposed me to a lot of stuff through reading, through um, just like the, what we could afford, like just doing like cultural things in Springfield. Um, and so whether that was plays or, um, you know, going like stay at the night museum, for instance, just all those sort of things that um, <clears throat> she valued. So she tried to find space and time for me to be able to do those things. Um, I forget where I was going that, but um, what was the question again? I'm so sorry. What are some life lessons you learned from military service? Um, yeah, I can't remember where I was going with that. Um, but most definitely, I think, oh, I was going to say, for me more than anything, I think was being exposed and being surrounded by people from all different backgrounds. I mean, basic training is just a, such an immersion into that, mm -hmm. that if you cannot quickly realize that we're all human beings and we're all in this together, then like you're just a horrible human being as far as I'm concerned. I think some people just really take that as like, I'm not gonna interact with anybody else, I'm only interact with like my people, my people. Um, and that was definitely one of my biggest takeaways for the first time really, really being under, like to understand like, I mean, I met someone from Turkey, I met someone from the Bronx, I met like, it's just so fascinating to think about um, how, when it all comes down to the military is this amazing system that allows you know great things to happen through collaboration and sort of letting go as many of those things um, one of the other things i felt like was really interesting was um i think to also really see a system that is always trying to empower people and, 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 and you know you look at basic training everyone thinks of basic training as that typical like to break you down and like make you feel horrible people don't realize that yeah that's there's a process in that um and so I remember when I was deployed, um, another sort of like um, mid-level commander um, recognized the work I was doing and stuff. And so I was offered to go have an opportunity to go sit in like a super like for like the top ten um, commanders. Um, and there was a couple of generals that were like that were there visiting at that time that were overseeing like big picture stuff that were going in the Middle East. And so they they invited me to come into um, a meeting. Um, that was like super confidential and that was such an awesome experience. I know that's about how they groom, you know, um, officers and stuff like that to kind of get them interested and see what else is out there. And, mm -hmm. um, that experience for me, I think really, um, helped me, all those combined helped me really see the staff that I've supervised and now of course the students that I'm going to be working with that I've, I've taught before, but, um, once again, seeing the potential in people. And that's, I think, a big thing that I was taught through having really great mentors, is how to be a good mentor through seeing their capabilities. Mm -hmm. yeah. right. How has your military service impacted your feelings about war and the military in general? Ooh, such a good question. Um, if I'm gonna be 100% honest, um, it, even while I was deployed, um, that was a really difficult time. I remember even, 9-11 um, happened and I was actually at the time working at the Illinois State Police um, doing some contractual work with the Firearms Bureau and um, I worked with people who I, I just felt like weren't aware of world issues and were um, a little bit ignorant to be honest. Um, I remember coming back, it was the day after 9-11, I was actually gone the day of 9-11 from working. I was um, up at ISU talking to a, um, an advisor there to transfer and um, and I remember coming back the next day and my colleagues um, were like, you're gonna go to war and like, you know, I hope you're prepared and just really just bizarre. Like they were like almost like revved up about it. And I was like, I don't, I don't know how you can see the good in what's just happened or that that's something that you would come and say to someone else. And so that kind of really sort of set the tone for how 9-11 like happened for me after that. And then of course, like being a veteran, like, you know, and now looking back of just like how our society perceives, perceives it. Um, but anyways, one thing in particular also, and I, I've told this story to my students before, I think it's really important of um, what it means to be an American and it doesn't look like, you know, it doesn't mean you, like, you have to like, there isn't, there isn't like flag burning and like frag, flag like displaying. There's like, it doesn't mean like that's all that there is, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and so I remember one in particular, there was another, a guy that I supervised and um, was really a jerk to begin with, but definitely targeted me because I pushed him to do his job. Um, and so him and I had a couple of side conversations about whatever and, and um, politics of why I felt like we were here for money, we were here for oil. Um, and so what he did, because um, I did, to, generally what we would do is in the, in the mornings we'd get our assignments and I would go out and then I'd 
um, meet with them as a team and we'd sort of talk about who was going to go where and team people up and that sort of thing. Um, and so there was a whiteboard and um, I came in one morning and he wrote on the, on the board, which my main name was Carrie, so he wrote, um, Staff Sergeant Carrie is un-American. And um, I still get chills thinking about that because it just broke my heart that in his mind I was un-American because I was challenging our government and challenging um, the way global society worked. And even now, I think it was even less global than it is now. Um, and so that has definitely changed by far. It's my, my opinion of that has gotten even more stronger. I've gotten more informed about what's really going on. Um, you know, it all comes down to money and power and greed, period. And so this has been going on for... <laughs> Since the beginning of time and how human beings are always looking to get you know um, to be on top mm -hmm. and so I think that in my opinion of how war um, impacts lives like real human beings that you just don't see in a TV 60 minute clip or 60 second clip you know um, so that definitely has changed my perspective on the other hand I think it has made me more grateful for what I would consider the right reasons why we've had war and conflict, um, and, and especially internally, I feel like that is like the most justified world. Conflict is when you're fighting within your own people because there's no outer influences that are fighting over that for money or greed, you know. Um, and hopefully, a better outcome comes from that. And you know, but when you look at other countries, our, I'm saying that from once again a very privileged democratic system, that you can't really see that from other countries who just never even had that to begin with. So they're in the civil wars is forever ongoing and ongoing and it's sort of um, what it's based in, we don't know. So anywho, um, so yeah, it's I think it's definitely ingrained my view of war a lot more in terms of um, I wish we didn't have war. I wish we could have a more peaceful world. I wish we didn't have guns. I wish, you know, um, that we could find a better way of really relating to each other as human beings. And you know, I mean, look at Syria, for instance, and so, um, those sort of things and, and um, images, you know, I, I contribute into my world the way I can. That's either as a veteran or as a civilian, um, hopefully betters it in some way instead of tearing it down and making it more hateful and bigoted and that sort of thing. So, mm -hmm. yeah. What message would you like to leave for future generations who will hear this interview? Be kinder to one another. Is there anything you feel we haven't discussed or should be added to this interview? And if so, what? Hmm. I think I've covered all my major talking points. Okay. <laughs> my banner, my, my veteran banners I carry, yes. Okay.